Hi, everyone. Today's three stories start off in a rural backroads section of Bayou Country, Louisiana, and then off to Kentucky, where a listener encounters something on a back road while driving home just before dawn. And finally, a listener on a solo trip in the southwestern United States encounters the most terrifying thing they've ever witnessed. So if you're cozied up and enjoying listening, please subscribe and turn on all notifications so we can do this again soon. Great. Now let's get into the stories. You know how everybody has a bucket list of things they want to do before they die? Well, I wish I'd left this off of mine. I'm a teacher at a local community college here in Denver, but my mom's family were from down south. One of the cool things about being a teacher is that you get summers off. So about 10 years ago, I decided to go to Louisiana on summer break. I wanted to meet some of the family I only knew through yearly Christmas cards. My great-aunt Marjorie offered to let me stay with her so I could save money on a hotel. She lived out in Slidell, close to the Mississippi border and smack in the middle of Bayou Country, so that was perfect. Aunt Marjorie acted like we had known each other for years and she was a lot of fun to talk to. She knew everybody in town, or they knew her, and she wasn't shy about offering her opinions. She sure let me know what that opinion was when I told her I was going to take a swamp tour. In fact, she got really touchy about it, saying one of my cousins could take me if I wanted. I thought that was weird, but when I asked why she didn't like my plan, all she'd say was that she had heard the company had a new guide. The swamp demanded respect, and I should go with a knowledgeable guide. Well, I thought that was sensible, so I double-checked to make sure that I would be on a tour with someone experienced. No problem, they assured me. I'd be on the boat with their best guide. So the day came, and I headed off to the tour office on the Pearl River. I was actually really excited. I was finally going to spend all day experiencing a place that had fascinated me for years. The tour group I was with had about seven other people in it, mostly out-of-town tourists like me. I was finally going to spend a day experiencing a place that had fascinated me for years. The tour group I was with had about seven other people in it, mostly out-of-town tourists like me. Check-in was fine, and I had already signed the We Won't Hold You Responsible If I Die waivers online, so the process was fast. Everything went well up until it came time to meet our guide. The guy who came out did not look like more than a kid. The receptionist introduced him as Dean and said that he would be taking us around the river. Now, I didn't want to make a fuss over something I was sure was a minor thing, but I'd also promised my great aunt that I would go with an experienced river man. I quietly pulled the receptionist aside and I asked her how much time Dean had had on the river. She told me not to worry, that Dean was fully qualified as a pilot and had all the safety briefings. Well, I figured that was the best I could do, and if my aunt asked, I would tell her the company assured me the pilot knew what he was doing. Dean really did seem to know what he was doing, and I felt a lot better about breaking my so-called promise to Aunt Marjorie. He piloted us up the river toward Honey Swamp. It was weird how relaxing everything was. The water lapping at the boat sides, the moss hanging down from the trees along the riverbank. It was the best. Dean told us he knew a good spot to see alligators, which made everybody excited. He said he would take us there after lunch. We stopped to eat in a sunny, wide part of the river. Dean pulled out the sandwiches and lemonade the tour company had packed. I think it was the whole experience that made everything taste so good. Once we finished, it looked to be a little later than I had thought. Or maybe that was because we were headed into the deeper part of the swamp. I don't know. But Dean was a good tour guide. He piloted the boat close to the shoreline when we saw wild pigs, and he let us watch them root around at the edge of the water. Dean kept up a steady stream of stories about the swamp. He also talked about the stories of the ghosts of the bayou, the people who have gone into the swamp and never came back, the stories of eyes glowing in the dark and of claw marks over ten feet high on trees. Logically, I knew that most of these stories would have simple explanations— like alligators or snakes or just unfortunate timing and people who weren't prepared. But with the atmosphere of the swamp itself pressing on us, the stories seemed a lot creepier. Getting to the good place for alligator watching seemed to take a little longer than I thought it would. 
but that was all right. Once Dean cut the motor, within a few minutes I could see ripples under the water and eye ridges coming up to the surface. Dean opened a compartment and pulled out some poles and a cooler full of meat scraps. He baited the poles with the meat and he handed them out so we could feed the gators. In spite of the slightly creepy atmosphere watching these Jurassic rejects launch themselves out of the water like living torpedoes was incredibly cool. They snatched the meat right off the tips of the poles. When we'd gone through the meat in the cooler, Dean then tried to start the motor, but the motor refused to turn over. The other tourists started muttering nervously, but our guide didn't seem too worried. He said he just needed a few minutes. The alligators were still milling around the boat, but with no meat being dangled over the sides, they were starting to vanish into the water. There was so much silt churned up that the river started to look like chocolate milk. And that was when I noticed that without a motor to hold us steady, the current had drifted us towards one of the banks of the river. I started taking pictures of the trees on my phone as we got closer, and the light was starting to shift and the moss and the twisted branches were starting to look very eerie. Something moved in the underbrush. I could hear the crunching. Whatever it was, it was big. Maybe it was a female gator coming away from a nest. I hoped it wasn't breeding season. The sound came again, and I thought about asking Dean what he thought it was, but I wanted him to fix the boat more than I wanted to know what the animal was, so I kept quiet. I wasn't the only thing quiet. Suddenly, I realized that there were no more bird sounds. The rest of the group noticed how silent everything was, too, and stopped talking. I started to think of all those stories about ghosts on the bayou and the people who never came back from the swamp. There was a loud crackle of branches, and I saw Dean look up from the control wiring he was messing with. I remember the look on his face. I don't know what was in the tree line, but I knew that Dean did, and it wasn't good. Suddenly, the boat motor chugged to life. Our guide got up as calm as could be and told us to hold on. And then he threw the thing into gear and he piloted us away from the bank and toward the middle of the river. When I turned back to look at the river bank, something was in the water. At first, I thought it was an alligator. But if it was, it was a big one. And the head was wrong. More like a lizard? No lizard is that large, though. It looked more like a dinosaur, which I knew wasn't possible. I moved away from the rest of the tour group to see if I could get a better look, and it rose out of the water. No, it stood up. It had shoulders like a human, but it was very clearly scaly. And that head? I looked around to see if any of the other tourists saw it, but no one was freaking. Did I really see what I thought I saw? When I looked back at where I had seen it, the thing was gone but there was a ripple in the water that was coming straight for us. It followed us for about a minute, but whatever it was, it couldn't swim as fast as the boat was moving. And then the ripple vanished. We got back to the dock safely and I went home to Aunt Marjorie, and the next day, I flew home. It's been a few years since then, but I still have no real idea what I saw that day. All I know is, I'm staying in Denver far away from any swamps from now on. A few years ago, I was stuck in a rut. Single, living alone in a dinky little apartment in a bad part of town, taking a few classes at the local community college, and working two jobs I hated just to make ends meet. One of them wasn't too bad, really. It was a part-time gig at a local after-school program a couple of times a week. It was geared towards teens, so at least they weren't too bratty. I actually still worked there up until a couple of months ago. The other job just plain stunk. I was the night receptionist at a crappy motel. I don't know how, but I swear all the weirdos and creeps and entitled people in the area must have had a conference or something, because I barely had a single decent customer interaction my entire time working there. Yeah, after two years, I was more than ready to quit. I managed to find work at a pizza place. Still not ideal, but much better than what I had, so I put in my two weeks' notice. Those final two weeks were plain awful. Maybe it was being so close to the finish line that made it seem worse in comparison, but I honestly think that my manager also made it harder out of spite. During my last week, she insisted that I work a few extra days since I was leaving. 
I don't think she was supposed to be able to do that, but she paid me overtime, and I needed the money, so I didn't make a fuss. After all, in just a few short days, I would be out of there for good. Some of the extra shifts were on the same days that I had my other job at the school. As a result, I barely slept that week since I had classes in the morning, the school job in the afternoon, and then the motel job all night long. By the Thursday of that last week, I was pretty much completely burnt out. I got off work at around 4 in the morning, hoping to get in a few hours of sleep before I had to get ready for school. Anyway, I got off work like normal and I went to take my normal route home. It was closed for road work. I couldn't believe my bad luck. According to GPS, the fastest detour was this weird loop around the suburbs and back into the city. There was a decent stretch where it was just this back road through an area without much in it. I guess it was because those roads would be pretty much deserted at any time of day, let alone before dawn. No stoplights, no traffic, barely any streetlights even. I was not happy, let me tell you. What a perfect way to end such a horrible week. I just kept repeating. Just one more day, just one more day, just one more day, like a mantra. Obviously, I was seriously tired. I started seeing strange shapes like flashing shadows out of the corners of my eyes, but I just brushed it off at first, just the darkness and my tired brain playing tricks on me. But then it started to get more frequent, and I clearly saw a dark shape in my rearview mirror. It looked like a huge bird gliding behind me. I started to freak out a little, I tried to tell myself it was just paranoia from sleep deprivation, but I could see it right there. It even left and came back a few times. And then I tried to tell myself it was just a big hawk or something, but it was clearly tailing me, specifically. I tried swerving across the road and it stayed in line with my car. Now I'm no avian expert, but that is not normal bird behavior. And just when I was really starting to freak, it was gone. It just sort of swooped up out of my mirror's view. I tried to catch my breath. It was really just gone. I made a plan to go straight to bed when I got home so that when I woke up, I would be able to tell myself that it was just a weird dream or hallucination. And then I saw the dark shape again. I watched it get bigger and bigger in the mirror. Not only was it not gone, but it was coming straight at me. I hit the gas hard, but the thing kept pace easily. It actually disappeared from the mirror as it flew faster than my car, which was well above the speed limit at this point. I felt the car even shiver as it zoomed past me. It kept diving down at me, flying back up and circling around before doing it again. It never actually hit me, but I knew that it wasn't because it couldn't. It was playing with me like a terrifying game of cat and mouse. Now, at the time, I was saving up for a convertible, but in the meantime, I was settling for an old Toyota Camry with a sunroof. I liked to drive with the sunroof open to make me feel a little better about not having a convertible. On this particular day, it was a little chilly, so I had the sliding cover open, but the actual window was closed. I'm pretty sure my heartbeat was louder than the road at this point, but it's about to get worse. The bird thing dove at my car again but this time it didn't stop short. I just remember flashes of this part, the shape in the mirror, and then the shadow overhead, and then there was this sharp thud on the roof and the car shook. I looked up through the sunroof just in time to see the outline of what looked almost like a person crouching. I full-on panicked. I hit the gas and I jerked the wheel, anything to get that thing away from me. And that was the only thought in my mind, get away. And then the car shook again as the thing pushed off of it. I swerved, spun out, landed in the grass just off the road. I wasn't hurt, but my nerves were destroyed. I waited until the sun came up before going the rest of the way. I know that sounds dumb, but I was literally frozen in fear. It never did come back, but even if it had, I'm not sure if I would have been physically able to move from that spot. Maybe this sounds like the delusional rantings of a sleep-deprived college student but I swear it was not a hallucination. I don't think it's possible to dream up the knowledge of what it's like to honestly fear for your life like that. And sure, I made it out without a scratch on me, but the thing that really keeps me up at night, even to this day, is the fact that whatever that thing was, it could have got me. 
but it chose to let me go. The only reason you are hearing this story is because it didn't feel like killing me that day. That's creepy. I'm not an outdoorsy person. Besides going to the beach to lay out, I cannot stand being around a lot of bugs or without solid Wi-Fi. My friends are totally the opposite, though. A few years ago, they convinced me to give camping a chance. I didn't want to, but they promised to do everything, and all I would need to do is eat, swim, and sleep, so I begrudgingly agreed. Where we went was in Transylvania County, North Carolina. Where, specifically, I couldn't say, and really, I don't have any desire now to ever know. I can admit the drive to the trail's parking was beautiful. So was the initial hike to where we would be camping. It was summer, so everything was lush and green. We made camp, and everything was uneventful for a few days. To be honest, I was bored out of my mind as day three approached. I had no idea how I would last for the whole week. And that's when one of my friends suggested hiking toward some waterfall that they had heard was off one of the trails. At first, I declined because who really wants to hike four miles for a waterfall that might not exist? But the alternative to stay by myself wasn't really comforting, so I grabbed a water bottle and some snacks and headed out with them. It took about an hour to get to this supposed hidden trail. None of us were really sure if what we found was even the right one, but we took the branched path anyway. The sun was high, and it was so humid, but I won't lie, it was incredibly beautiful. Even the swarms of flying bugs along the way didn't sour my mood too much. We'd been hiking down a path one of my friends called a game trail that animals used. It was pretty overgrown, surrounding the worn, thin line that we walked single file along. As another hour turned into two, we still hadn't come across any waterfalls, or even streams when we finally reached a small clearing along the path. The clearing couldn't have been more than maybe ten feet across. We stopped for a minute as everyone was sort of deciding if it was worth it to continue, and that's when one of my friends first smelled it. It took me a minute to notice because I can admit I wasn't in the best shape and catching my breath took a little longer than I would have liked. The smell was putrid, though, and it stung my nostrils. It slowly filled the air around us, too. One of my friends suggested a skunk, but another one said no. They said it smelled like something was dead. This made us all very quiet. My friend looked unsettled and was glancing around for signs of what it could be. And that's when we first heard the whooping noise. That's the closest way I can describe it. It came in bursts, some short, but others drawn out like some twisted language that none of us understood. There was no time for us to do anything but share scared looks when we heard trees falling ahead of us on the path, a path that led further out of the clearing. In a moment of awareness, I realized I couldn't hear anything else but the sound of trees snapping. We were all so scared we didn't make a sound. Whatever was knocking down the trees was getting closer. So was the whooping noise. My friends and I were frozen still, and that's when I felt one of their hands grab me and pull me back down the trail that we had originally come along. I asked what was happening, but all they said was, We have to go. That thing is huge. We hurried as fast as the path allowed, being chased by whoops and snapping trees the whole way until we got back to where the trail originally branched off. Most of us needed time to catch our breath by then. And that's when one of my friends screamed, I turned to look where they were pointing, and it was back down the path that we had just left. It couldn't have been more than 50 yards back, but we saw it just staring at us. Close to 10 feet tall, covered in dark brown hair with a lighter colored face. It had dark eyes and sharp teeth protruding from its mouth, and it looked like a huge gorilla that stood on two legs. We were staring in shock. When the wind blew and we smelled that putrid stench from before. And then it snarled. None of us stuck around to wait. We were running and pushing and shoving as we headed back to our campsite. It felt like it took forever, but we finally made it. And that's when we saw something that made us decide to leave right then. Three of our tents had been torn and crushed. 
Several fallen trees that were all pretty thick had been twisted and impaled on top of them. My friend said to just ditch the gear and let's leave, and we did just that. The sun was starting to set when we reached the parking lot. One of my friends said that they would contact the local rangers later. We all just wanted to get out of those woods. The car ride back to the city was full of Bigfoot talk, and sometimes my friends called it a skunk ape. We had no idea how to know what it was we saw. I don't really even want to know. I haven't been camping since. I'm sure you're not surprised, even with more invitations. Some places are just better left alone because you never really know what lurks deep in Mother Nature. Even safe in my apartment at night with the doors locked, camera down the hall, and the alarm on, I still see that beast when I close my eyes sometimes. The nightmares don't happen as often now, but I will gladly take busy traffic and fast food 24 hours a day over seeing that thing ever again. Let me know what you think about these stories in the comments below. And don't forget to check out Donovan Dread, who releases almost every single day. Also, if you like true crime, then check out Donovan Dread True Crime. There are new releases several times a week.